Grace to you and peace from God our Father and our Lord and Savior Jesus the Christ. Amen. In my message on Good Friday, I noted that fear saturated the story of Jesus' last day. Uh, The chief priests and the other religious leaders were afraid of Jesus. They were afraid that he was becoming too popular with the people and might unseat them from their positions of power. They were also afraid of the Romans. They were afraid that Jesus might attract too much attention from the Romans, and the Romans might react in a negative and violent fashion, destroying their temple and destroying their nation. Pontius Pilate was also afraid. He was afraid of the crowds and of rioting and of violence and things getting out of hand because of this Jesus. He was also afraid that his reputation and loyalty to the Roman emperor were being questioned because he repeatedly tried to release Jesus. And so in the end, he had him crucified. The disciples too, they were afraid and scattered when the authorities arrested Jesus because fear is a powerful motivator I remember I was in sixth grade at the time, uh, which was still grade school back then. Uh, It didn't really matter all that much in my school because the grade school and junior high were all still in the same building. There was a seventh grader who would see me from time to time throughout the day, not that I wanted to see him, mind you. He was a bully. He was big and he had it in for me. He sought me out whenever he could to torment me. I should say that he really wasn't all that mad at me personally, but he was mad at my father, who was the junior high principal in the school and had regular occasion to visit with this student. I was just the easy target for his anger. Well, during the day, he would regularly taunt me by Uh, telling outrageous stories about my father and that I was too chicken to stand up to him. Well, actually, he was right about that. I was too afraid to stand up to him. But I was getting a lot of pressure from my friends uh, to do something about this guy, and they suggested in their not-too-subtle sixth-grade boy manner that I might indeed be chicken. Well, so I was torn. I was afraid of this big bully and what he was likely to do to me if we ever got into a fight, and I was afraid of losing the respect of my friends. Well, one afternoon, right after school, we were walking outside, and there was the bully with his friends waiting for me. And I was with a group of my friends, and immediately he started in on me in front of all of them. And the older boys started to laugh, and then I noticed some of my friends start to laugh too. I'd finally had enough. I threw down my books and I told him to put up or shut up. I surprised him, I think. I surprised my friends, I think I surprised his friends, and I know I surprised myself. He said, okay, and then turning to his friends said, this won't take long. But as he was saying this, I had already stepped forward and threw a punch, more like a roundhouse right, with all my strength, and I connected with his face, and he went down like a stone. His nose was bleeding when I jumped on top of him and continued to hit him. He wasn't smiling anymore. In fact, I could see that there was fear in his eyes. And he yelled for his friends to help, and they pulled me off of him, And he got up and he went away swearing that he would have his revenge. I didn't feel victorious, I didn't feel vindicated, but I felt a little sick inside that I had made someone else feel so afraid. I'd like to say that was the end of the bullying, and in one way it was, he didn't bother me in school so much anymore, but he later stole my bike and wrecked it. He was kind of a messed up kid. But you know, fear, fear is a powerful thing. Robert Wilson, writing in an issue of Psychology Today, says, there are many things that motivate us, but the most powerful motivator of all is fear. 
Fear is a primal instinct that served us as cave dwellers and still does today. It keeps us alive because if we survive a bad experience, we're never going to forget how to avoid it in the future. Our most vivid memories are born in fear because adrenaline etches them into our brains. Nothing makes us feel more uncomfortable than fear, and we have so many things to be afraid of. Fear of pain, fear of disease, injury, failure, fear of not being accepted, fear of missing an opportunity, feeling of, fear of being scammed by someone, just to name a few. Fear invokes uh, the flight or fight re uh, syndrome or response in us, and our reaction is always to flee back to our comfort zone. And if we don't know the way back, we are likely to follow whoever will show us the way. Marketers use fear as a motivator as often as they can. They present a scenario they hope will invoke our sense of fear, and then they show us a solution, a path back to our comfort zone that usually entails purchasing their product or their service. Fear is used to sell virtually everything. Cars, tires, life insurance are all classic examples. Clever marketers will use fear to sell anything, breakfast cereal, deodorant, uh, antibacterial soap, you name it. And you know, politicians and preachers are not adverse to using fear themselves to motivate people one way or another. Well, Wilson goes on to say that fear can also paralyze us, the classic deer caught in the headlights syndrome. Well, it is perhaps that kind of fear that has gripped the disciples of Jesus after Good Friday. We are told that they are hiding away behind locked doors for fear of the religious authorities. On, one, on the one hand, they had very good reason to be afraid. Jesus, the leader of their little band, their little community, had been executed by the authorities, and they had every reason to be believe that if they were arrested too, the same fate would befall them. On the other hand, Jesus had promised them, not once, but three times, that this was all going to happen, and that on the third day he would rise from the dead. And yet their fear had paralyzed them into hiding out. They didn't even try to go back to Galilee, which was their home but they lay low doing who knows what while they waited for something to happen or not happen. Because fear is a powerful thing. In the midst of their locked doors and fears walks the resurrected Jesus. Now, here's a moment in the story when I think the disciples really should be afraid. Because remember, they have abandoned him, and now he is in the same room with them, having been resurrected from the dead, or at least he's a ghost, and by any normal human standards might be angry or disgusted or disappointed or all of the above with his followers. But the first words out of Jesus' mouth are words of reassurance. Peace be with you. And then he showed them his hands and he showed them his side to demonstrate to them that he was not a ghost. And then it says the disciples rejoiced when they saw the Lord. Isn't that weird? He's been standing there now for several minutes showing them and talking to them and now they recognize him. You see, they didn't really see him for who he was. They didn't recognize him until he speaks and shows them his wounds and he says, peace be with you. He says it again. Twice, Jesus offers to his disciples peace because he doesn't want them to be afraid any longer. He doesn't want them paralyzed by their fears, but ready to do instead the mission and ministry that he has before them as the church. Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, so I send you. And then we have John's version of the Pentecost story. 
where Jesus gives his followers the gift of the Holy Spirit by breathing on them. Jesus is equipping his followers with the Holy Spirit so that he can send them out into the world forgiving others so that all the world might know and believe in him. But he doesn't send them out just yet. You see, there's still one of the group that is not there to receive this gift of the Spirit and of this peace. His name is Thomas, called the twin. We don't know where he is. We don't know why he isn't with them. But Jesus doesn't want to leave any of his disciples behind because all are needed in this mission and ministry that is ahead of them. And when, Re when Jesus returns a week after Easter, he appears again in the room, though the doors are shut, but notice they're not locked this time. And again he says to them, peace be with you. Jesus wants to allay their fears by offering his peace to this group, which now includes the final holdout, Thomas. And then Jesus offers the same proof that he offered the first time to the other disciples, to show him his hands and his side to Thomas. But incidentally, Thomas does not take him up on the offer, but he confesses, my Lord and my God. And then Jesus, as if he were looking over the shoulders of the disciples, says to someone in the background, blessed are those who have not seen and yet have come to believe. The mysterious people to whom Jesus is talking is us. Just as he blessed those first disciples with his peace and the Holy Spirit, he passes this on to us, his followers of today. Fear is a powerful thing, but the peace of Christ and the Holy Spirit are more powerful yet. It was Christ's peace and the Holy Spirit that allowed the, these disciples to overcome their fears and sent them out into the world to spread the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ. It was this peace and this spirit that bound these once fearful followers into a community of believers that eventually becomes the church. It's the same peace and the same spirit that binds believers and followers today all across the world in Christ. It helps us to see that our fears and our anxieties do not have to have power over our lives, but that we may trust in Christ's love and presence in all things to see us through whatever this world can throw at us. Fear is a powerful thing, but Christ's peace and the Holy Spirit with us, nothing can stand in our way. Amen.